Okay. All right. Okay, so we are going to uh, continue on here with Buddhism. And where I ended last, uh, I was talking a, a bit about the teachings of Siddhartha, the teachings of the Buddha. Okay, so we went through a number of key teachings there. And uh, of course, before that, I talked about his life and how he attained enlightenment and how he preaches the first sermon in Deer Park to the first followers, those previous five ascetics uh, that he hung out with when he was trying the Jainist path. And now we have the foundations and the beginning of Buddhism as a religion, where we have the leader with his ideas, his first committed followers, <clears throat> who are going to now uh, receive his teachings and they get spread. And it's going to be a movement that will grow. And so, what will happen here is that in his lifetime, and Siddhartha will live on for another, what, 45 years. <laughs> uh, and so he will be gathering many disciples who will follow him. And they'll basically be living like the holy men did in India, the ascetics, the renunciates, uh, those who renounce the life of a householder, you know, just dropped out of the whole social game of having a job, raising a family, going to work, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, and instead be committed full-time on the spiritual path and basically take on a monastic type of lifestyle right so this is what his followers did is they took up the path of renunciation of the householder life and were committed to a uh, full time to following the teachings of Siddhartha and doing their meditation and of course they then would beg for food and the local community would give them and provide for their needs and so what happens right here at the outset is Buddhism as a religion is fundamentally a monastic type of religion where if you're serious about the spiritual path, you're expected to leave behind uh, the life of the householder, right, in terms of having a career and having a family and doing that game. And so that is what would be expected of you if you're serious about seeking enlightenment. And for the lay people, those who do not take up the path in such a serious, committed way of renouncing their lives as householders, they then would gain, in a sense, good karma or spiritual merit if they provided and met the needs of those who are monks and future nuns. And uh, they would provide the food for them, any kind of clothing, uh, perhaps medicine, any, any of their needs would be met. They would provide it for them. And in doing that, it's like they get good karma and it guarantees for them a better rebirth. And that's as far as they could go. That's their, the only hope they could have is a better rebirth and gaining good karma right? Uh, they have no hope of attaining nirvana, being set free from samsara, set free from future rebirth. That can only be a hope, a possible goal, if you take up the spiritual path full time and enter the monastic life. So anyways, this is how it got set up very early on in the beginning, and that was, has always been then central to the Buddhist religion, okay? Even if it goes into China or Tibet or where have you. So, uh, so as I mentioned, so Zadatha gathers many disciples and, uh, and he established then guidelines for that monastic life. And eventually he was basically pressured by his cousin to allow women into the monastic life, that there could be nuns known as, uh, actually the monks are known as bhikkhus and the women were known as nuns, known as bhikkhunis. And so they enter, could enter into the monastic life. But then he also established guidelines for those who do not enter the monastic life for the laity. And I'll go through those in a bit uh, on another slide. As I had mentioned already, he rejected the caste system, the authority of the Hindu scriptures, and the authority of the Hindu priests. And that is fundamentally why it is a new and different religion. And so, as I mentioned, he lived for another 40 years after his enlightenment. And then he ended up uh, eating some food that was bad, not purposely poisoned, but uh, it had gone bad. <laughs> and again, you know, they were begging for food and somebody provided some food for him and uh, it was ended up being rather lethal. And so he then died of food poisoning. Okay. And after his death, then his remains, he was cremated and his remains then were kept as relics uh, the ashes and bones as relics, and they were housed then in what's known as stupas, and these are just a couple of pictures of stupas, 
um, structure of the building. And these sort of became holy places um, where later on Buddhists might want to go on a pilgrimage there uh, to pay respects to the Buddha. And it uh, could be places of meditation if people choose. And they were largely then and widely built by somebody who's going to become a big promoter of Buddhism. And that is King Ashoka, as you can see him here at the picture on the right. And so what happens after Siddhartha's death, for about two centuries, Buddhism spread mainly along the Ganges Valley River there. And, uh, and then after the conversion of King Ashoka, it spread rapidly throughout India and also beyond India. And you can see the dates when he ruled, uh, 272 to 236 BC. And King Ashoka, he uh, conquered a larger region of India to establish his kingdom. And when he did, as a result of that, he then encountered Buddhism as a result of these conquests, the sort of in terms of the region that he conquered. And he was extremely impressed with Buddhists, with their commitment to nonviolence and compassion and uh, their teachings. Uh, so much so that he converted to Buddhism and then strongly supported Buddhism. And in that regard, he himself then put an end to animal sacrifice. Now, this is something a lot of people don't realize because, you know, in more, well, some time, a few hundred years after this is when uh, the cow eventually became sacred. And there's no way uh, you would eat beef or, you know, kill a cow in India. It became a holy sacred animal. That did not exist in ancient times. And uh, the cows were a regular form of sacrifice, okay, in their rituals to the gods. And so he abolished all animal sacrifices that were very central to Hinduism at that time. He also then built these monuments uh, everywhere that uh, listed uh, key teachings and principles of Buddhism to promote Buddhist ideas. And, uh, and he himself uh, quit hunting. It was one of his favorite uh, pastimes was hunting. And he stopped that because he uh, refused to kill any animals. And he himself even entered into the monastic life for a short period of time just to commit himself to meditation. And he had two children that went on to become Buddhist missionaries, spreading Buddhism. So he was very key here in establishing Buddhism in India and spreading it throughout India. Okay, and as you can see here, he's the one that established the Mauryan Empire, which became a very famous empire in India. So in this sense, you know, he's a little bit similar to what the Emperor Constantine did for Christianity. You know, there's some, you know, again, similarities in terms of just establishing these religions. Okay, so I had mentioned earlier uh, the sort of distinction between those who enter the monastic life versus the lay people who did not, who remained householders, right? This is where some of the uh, principles were laid out in terms of what was expected of people. And these are known as the 10 precepts of Buddhism that are there. And these largely represent and are very um, operative in early Buddhism, what's going to become known largely as Theravada Buddhism, which we'll talk about uh, here shortly. So the 10 precepts of Buddhism, the first five, uh, to abstain from the taking of any life, okay, killing any living being, harming any living being, uh, to abstain from stealing, okay, any kind of sexual misconduct, not to lie, and also to abstain from drinking liquor. Okay, so these are a bit similar to when we talked about the Noble Eightfold Path, right, in terms of right speech, right action, right livelihood. These are sort of elements that come into that category. And so these five, these first five, uh, are to be followed by the lay people, the laity, okay, the householders, uh, whereas the monks also would hold on to these five, but they would also hold on to the last five. So those who enter the monastic life, who are part of the Sangha, the Buddhist monastic community, they hold to all 10 precepts, whereas the lay people are only expected to follow the first five, okay, just so you're clear on that. And so the last five is obviously, as you can see there, uh, if you are a monk or a nun, you would not eat past the noon hour. You would not watch any form of entertainment of dancing and singing and shows. Okay? You abstain from any kind of self-adornment of uh, jewelry, perfumes, ointments, anything to beautify, adorn the self. You would not use a soft high bed, but a low hard one. And you abstain from the handling of silver or gold or basically money. Okay, those are the additional five precepts expected of um, the, those who enter the monastic life. And this is one key thing <clears throat> about Buddhism, and, and especially in this early period here, uh, it was very much 
focus more on practice, on what you did. Okay, uh, that was a key thing that often would divide uh, groups and people. It's about what they act, their their way of living and how they lived and what they did, as opposed to the nitpicky details of belief. Uh, yes, indeed, they embraced the teachings of the Buddha, but for the most part, you know, uh, they're pretty deep, highly philosophical, and for the lay people. They, they wouldn't even know what they really were. They wouldn't know a whole lot about what the beliefs all entail. They would be very, very simple and basic. Okay. Okay. And, and so the purpose of being in the Sangha, the monastic community, is that it provides a context conducive to meditation practice. Okay. That's a key thing. Uh, you have, uh, you're withdrawn from the engagements of everyday life. You don't have the responsibilities of everyday life, of bringing in the dollar, right? Creating an income, providing for a family, uh, you know, government. Uh, you don't have any of those responsibilities, right? So you're basically given permission to have that removed from your life. So you could 100% focus and dedicate yourself on the practice of meditation and, in, and teaching and understanding uh, Buddha's ideas. And then also you would then bring that, the truth of Buddhism to the community, be responsible for teaching that to others in some way to the community, okay? All right, well, what we find happening though as well during this time and then about, by about 200 BC uh, in Buddhism, there developed around 17 to 18 different schools okay various kind of sects if you like and they would have sort of different tweaks different interpretations of what the buddha taught or maybe a little bit tweaks in, in practice uh, but some differences between them of those early schools of buddhism only one has remained and continued on to this day and that is the theravada school and the word theravada means the school of the elders this is the oldest school of buddhism as i had mentioned earlier it is the one that is the closest to what the buddha actually taught okay and, uh, and it's the only one that has continued right up to the present time. It is what's dominant in South Asia, okay? Things like Thailand, Sri Lanka, et cetera. Um, yeah. However, what happens though in the history of Buddhism is that around 100 BC, we have a more liberal wing of Buddhism developing. And uh, they start introducing new teachings, new ideas that are, you find these in new scriptures that are being composed. And in these new scriptures with these new teachings, they were written in Sanskrit, okay? Whereas the oldest and older teachings of the Buddha and the, the, the text, the dialect used by within the Theravada school, for example, is Pali, okay? And that's why when I did the teachings of the Buddha, I had Pali and Sanskrit always there, okay? And so, and the idea here of what the Mahayana Buddhist says, uh, they said that the teachings that they're bringing are not new ideas. They held that these teachings are what the Buddha himself actually taught, but that the Theravadins or, you know, the older school of Buddhists, the conservatives, they're basically the conservatives, right? Uh, they held that they just didn't get it. Uh, they were there, they maybe heard the Buddha talk, but when the Buddha presented these higher truths and higher teachings, it just went right over their head <laughs> and they missed it. They didn't get it. Whereas the Mahayana Buddhists, they, and I'll get, explain the term in a second, they, uh, they received those higher teachings. And so they claimed that these new ideas that they're putting forth here now are not their creations, but are authentically from the Buddha himself. Okay. But the Theravada, or the older conservative Buddhists, uh, they were so, basically it was pejorative, that they were so dense in consciousness that they weren't able to receive these higher truths. That's basically the thrust of it. And so they then come up with the terms that they are the Mahayanas and the older conservative Buddhists are the Hinayana Buddhists. And what do we mean by Maha versus Hina, Yana. The word Yana means vehicle. And sort of the metaphor that's used here in Buddhism is that Buddhism is like a boat, a vehicle, a boat specifically, that takes you from one piece of land here across the waters of samsara to the land on the other side that's nirvana. Okay, so Buddhism is a vehicle, the means, the boat that will take you over to, quote, nirvana. And they held that the conservative Buddhists, their boat was tiny. Hina means small, the lesser 
vehicle. It's the tiny boat that can only take a few people over to Nirvana. Okay. Because the conservatives taught a very difficult path of Buddhism, that the only way to get enlightened is through your own self-effort. You have to do the work, and it's tough, and there's no guarantee you're going to get enlightened in this lifetime. Hardly any, anybody ever does. And it takes such dedication, such hard work and self-effort. Very few people get over to nirvana. Okay. But the Mahayanas, the liberals here, they say, we have Maha. Maha means great. <laughs> it's we've got the big boat, man. You know, we got the yacht, the ferry that can take thousands of people across. In fact, our boat is so big, it can take everybody across. We have the way of bringing everyone to nirvana to set them free from the cycle of rebirth. All right. Why? Because we have an easier way. There is an easier way that we have that has been made available to us in this dark age, in these dark and difficult times. So if you remember in Hinduism, we talked about, and this is very much a part of Indian cosmology in terms of cycles and ages of time, and that we have entered into the Kali Yuga, the dark age, right? And in the dark age, it is so difficult to become enlightened. We need help. We need an easier way. And in Hinduism, we saw that that easier way was through bhakti, the way of devotion to Krishna, okay? And the whole Krishna, uh, the, the, the vice Vaishnavite tradition predominantly is devotion to a supreme being, a personal God who will save you and through an act of grace will bring you out of uh, the realm of samsara if you have enough loving devotion and commit all your deeds, all your actions, all your thoughts is done out of service to the supreme being, right? Uh, that's sort of the whole bhakti movement that developed and that this is the easier way in these dark times. Well, similarly here in Buddhism, we have beings that are going to help us get there, all right? They're going to become known as the bodhisattvas, these super beings that, like uh, the gods in India that come out of the, in terms of the bhakti movement, they too can just, through an act of grace, eliminate our past bad karma, all right? Wipe it out for us and bring us into one of their heavens. We're there in that heaven. They'll bring us to enlightenment. And from there, we go on to nirvana. So we can be guaranteed that this will be our last birth here in this miserable realm of samsara, in this wheel of existence. Okay, we'll be set free. So anyways, I'll kind of explain that all more in a sec. Here, I'm jumping ahead. But it's these new scriptures with new teachings, new ideas. Okay, we're going to go through these all in a sec. That the Mahayana Buddhist bring, and, and the key uh, rhetoric here is that they've got the big boat that's going to bring everybody over to nirvana all living beings all conscious living beings will be brought into enlightenment we have an easier way in this dark age that we're in so there's hope for everyone okay and so uh when you look at the new scriptures that were written in uh sanskrit uh, somebody did a bit of a content analysis of them and it said that only 5% of the material in these new scriptures is a continuation of the old teachings, right? And 65% is entirely new stuff, all right? Totally new ideas, okay? And 30% is a reinterpretation of the old Buddhism, all right? And that's why I said at the very beginning, uh, Buddhism is going to go through so much change. It's almost like we're dealing with different religions. There's so many different kinds of Buddhisms. Okay, there's not one unified Buddhism. All right, it's a big thing here. Just be aware of that. Okay, so what are some of these new concepts? <clears throat> In terms of that Mahayana Buddhism introduces here. Oh, I didn't know I had a video there. Oh, I think it's a little video. I'll probably put that somewhere. Okay. So anyway, in Mahayana Buddhism, we have eight new scriptures. Okay, this is again a contrast. Hinayana Buddhism is on one side and Mahayana is on the other side. Okay. And just to compare, we have different collections of scriptures. Okay. Uh, Mahayana scriptures were written in Sanskrit. The Hinayana or the Theravada, because they don't, the Theravada Buddhists, they don't like the term Hinayana. Buddhism. They don't like to be called Hinayana Buddhists because it was a it was a pejorative term. Okay, it was derogatory. It was a put down. You know that oh you guys, you know, here's it's a small little lesser Buddhism, and we've got you know the great Buddhism. So they don't like that term. 
me. But uh, so their scriptures are the earlier scriptures. They're more conservative and they were written in Pali, right? Now, as I mentioned, they held basically, you can only attain enlightenment through your own self-effort. And because it's a matter of self-effort, full-on dedication, and it's very difficult, only a few will attain nirvana. Okay, that's why it's a small boat. Furthermore, they held that Buddha was just a man, a human being, extraordinary human being, uh, exceptional human being, but he was a human being like you and I, right? And in addition to that, they held there's only three Buddhas. There was a Buddha in the past, of a past age, that had brought Buddhism, the truth, these truths to the world at one time, but that truth had been lost and forgotten. And so remember, the wheel of Dharma came to a stop. The wheel of truth came to a stop. Okay, The truth of Buddhism had been forgotten and lost. And then Siddhartha comes to earth here and rediscovers the truth and teaches it and brings it back into the world. And the wheel of truth, the wheel of Dharma gets turning again. So he's the Buddha of the present time. But they held, excuse me, that the truth of Buddhism that we have now is going to get lost again down the road in a million years or who knows how long down the road. Uh, it's going to be lost and forgotten. And so there's going to be a Buddha of the future. And that's Maitreya. Maitreya is the Buddha of the future who right now is waiting in a heaven, the Toshita heaven, the same heaven that Siddhartha was in before he came to earth. Remember I told you that story, how he entered his mother's side, Queen Maya's side, you know, uh, and chose her that this is the time to come to earth. Well, likewise, Maitreya is up there in a heaven uh, waiting for the right time to come to earth in the future. Okay. Okay, so those are sort of, you know, the basic ideas there of Hinayana Buddhism. Then in contrast, Mahayana Buddhist new teachings in, uh, in new scriptures written in Sanskrit, and they held that we have an easier way that we need for these dark times where everybody can have hope of attaining enlightenment and being set free from rebirth. And how can that happen? Because of the role of these bodhisattvas, which I'll go through in a bit, okay? And then that gave rise to what's known as Pure Land Buddhism. You just have faith in the bodhisattvas, and they then will bring you from this life to a heaven and from that heaven to nirvana. Okay, that's what's going to develop there. And then lastly, they also deify the Buddha. We have a deification of the Buddha that takes place. And I'll, again, I'll unpack all of this here in, in the slides down below. Okay, all right. So this is, again, just a contrast, and this is going to lead to the rise of a whole new form of Buddhism. And then, as I had mentioned way back <laughs> in another video, in the beginning of Buddhism, is there's going to be all kinds of different sects and schools here. And many of them will become extinct. Some will continue and they'll evolve. And Pure Land Buddhism is going to be a main one. Zen Buddhism is going to be another main one. All right, and we'll kind of go into those. Okay, so... Bodhisattvas, okay, Bodhi, enlightenment, sattvas, beings, right? These are beings destined for enlightenment or have already attained enlightenment. They're enlightened beings or on the way to becoming enlightened beings, okay? So the word Bodhisattva means that beings destined for enlightenment and some already are or some are just on the way. And you have Bodhisattvas that exist at two levels. You can have human Bodhisattvas and celestial or heavenly Bodhisattvas. And so, uh, you, you know, all bodhisattvas, if they're heavenly bodhisattvas, they once were humans. And as a human being, a bodhisattva had made the vow, what's called the bodhisattva vow. They had at one point made this commitment that would span across lifetimes, that they will postpone attaining nirvana, being set free from rebirth leaving samsara, attaining nirvana, that they would postpone that, even if they get enlightened. Remember in the very beginning, which bodhi is enlightenment, and enlightenment uh, is the cause that produces the effect that you can be set free from rebirth. But they are beings that, oh, when I become enlightened, I'm going to choose not to leave samsara, all right, and be freed from rebirth. I'm going to choose to stay here within samsara as an enlightened being in order to help all other living beings get to nirvana first. Okay, so, so when they take up the Bodhisattva, they make this commitment, they're going to postpone 
their own attainment of nirvana, even though they've become enlightened and they now can leave this realm of rebirth, right? Leave samsara to go and on to nirvana, whatever that is. <laughs> they decide they're going to postpone it and they commit to sticking around here to help all living beings. So they embody the Buddhist idea of compassion. Compassion. They're attaining enlightenment, not just to stop their suffering, but they're committed to stopping all the suffering of all living beings. Okay. So, so, uh, so the, the metaphor that gets used here is imagine the Great Wall of China. And there's a great wall of China, which is huge, right? And as humans, it's like, oh, I can't get over that wall. We're just tiny little midgets. I can't get over this wall. And along comes a giant. And the giant can easily step over the great wall of China and get to the other side. But all the little people, oh, help, help, we can't get over. But the giant decides to on, stay on one side and throw all the people over. Okay, I'm going to get you over, get you over, get you over, get all these people over the Great Wall. And once all people have gotten over the Great Wall because they need his help, they can't get up there on their own, then the giant takes a step over himself. Okay, But he doesn't cross over that wall until he's helped all other living humans get over the wall. That's what the, basically the role of the Bodhisattva. Okay? They postpone going on to nirvana until they help all living beings get there first. Okay? And so it's a mission of compassion, as I say here, to liberate all. And there are many beings in this category all right, uh, where they uh, do this. And it's held, um, let me just think here. Uh, is there anything else that I want to say? Okay, so yeah, let me just kind of continue on here. Just one minute here. As I mentioned, there's human and celestial. So all present day heavenly bodhisattvas once were human beings and had made this vow, this commitment, and then they lived lifetime after lifetime, lifetime after lifetime, of living such a good life of, and, and of creating so much good karma, you know, of so, so much selfless service, giving and doing and serving and giving and doing and serving lifetime after lifetime after life. So they built up like a huge bank account of good karma, all right? A huge bank account of good karma. Uh, and, uh, and then they're no longer born in the human realm. They then get born in the heavenly realm, in the realm of the gods. Remember those six realms of rebirth? Okay. They then reincarnate, re, I know there's reincarnation, okay. Uh, they are reborn in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly realm. And then from there, in the heavens, they're accessible to us here on earth. We can pray to them. They can help us out because they're still here within the realms of samsara. They're in the heavenly realm. Whereas the Buddha, he's not around. He's not here. He's not in a heaven. He's outside and beyond the six realms of rebirth. He's outside and beyond samsara. Okay. Uh, that's the key thing here that a lot of people don't realize, you know, even though they may pray to the Buddha, it's like, hello, he really doesn't hear your prayers, <laughs> according to the system. Okay, so uh, that's a key thing. However, I now, as if I were a Buddhist devotee, I could make the Bodhisattva vow myself, and I could take up that path where I commit this present lifetime, okay, of making this vow and making this commitment that I will just do good and serve and have compassion and create all this good karma. And I'm willing to incarnate again and to do it over again and over again. And I'm just committed to helping all living beings eventually get to nirvana, that that's going to be my uh, soul path, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Okay, so you can make that vow as a human being and be on the Bodhisattva path now as a human being. There are those who had done that in the past, and they're already now in the heavenly realm, okay? And that's why you've got human and celestial bodhisattvas, okay? Okay, so, so the key figure here in, in this kind of category is Amitabha Buddha, okay? Uh, Amitabha meaning boundless light and love. And so it's held that once upon a time, eons and eons ago, uh, uh, this person was a king and was a king at the time of the Buddha of the past when, when he was here on earth. Okay, and who knows, like millions of years ago, who knows how long ago that was. And, uh, and at that time, this king heard the Buddha of the past and he then made the Bodhisattva vow, made this commitment 
and took up that path and lived lifetime after lifetime of doing acts of selfless service, compassion, creating all this good karma, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And he made a vow that when he had lots of good karma, he would create this beautiful paradise of a heaven called Western Paradise, this wonderful heaven, and that he would reside in that heaven. And any humans that prayed to him and asked and, and, and put their faith in him, he would then reach down and remove all their bad karma and guarantees that you will be brought into his heaven. And from there, he would bring you over to nirvana. He would bring you into enlightenment from his heavenly place. Okay. And hopefully you guys all get that. Okay. And so, so anyone who takes refuge, has, places their faith, calls upon Amitabha Buddha, right? Uh, he will bring you into his Western paradise. It's also sometimes called the pure land, also sometimes called the happy land. Okay, those are the three titles associated with it. Happy land, pure land, pure, Western paradise. Okay. And then from there, under his guidance and teaching, because he is enlightened, uh, he will then bring you over to nirvana. So you can then be guaranteed, if you have faith in Amitabha Buddha, you call upon him, this will be your last birth, your last time here on earth. And at death, you are brought into his heaven. And there, no evil, no pain, no suffering. It's wonderful. It's a heavenly kind of experience. All women are born as men there. <laughs> That's one of the supposedly good things about it. Uh, and from there, you're brought into nirvana. So, so that's, uh, it's going to become known, uh, become a sect that's going to become very popular in Buddhism known as the Pure Land sect, okay, the Pure Land sect. It's one of the very popular Mahayana schools of Buddhism. Uh, in Japan, Amitabha is known as Amida, Amida Buddha, okay, Amida Buddha. Okay, and again, it's very popular in Japan. Let me see what's in the next slide. Now, we have other beings here um here you have oh, i kind of go down here i guess i don't know if, if i move my thing if that actually moves for you guys i don't know avalokiteshvara avalokiteshvara is a bodhisattva who is basically like an assistant to amitabha buddha and avalokiteshvara it means the lord who looks in every direction all right and you can see here in the statue it's like you know a thousand hands reaching out these are like a thousand hands reaching out they all add up all the little ones going around and then there's the bigger ones up front and in these each of those hands you'll see in the palm there will be then an eye okay an eye there and the image is what's meant to convey here is that Avalokiteshvara is reaching out a hand of loving compassion and help to help every living being in samsara in any kind of way he can. He's reaching out a hand of help to all living beings everywhere, meaning that he's present everywhere, accessible to everyone everywhere, reaching out a hand of help. Okay, so it's a hand of help. And in the hand is the eye. And that implies that he can see everyone everywhere. He is present everywhere. He knows what you're going through or what your issues are. Okay, so it's a hand of help and he's all seeing, all knowing, reaching out to all living beings to extend help. And so here, see, this is the interesting thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, Buddhism is not a God-centered, God-focused religion. But what happens here is the bodhisattvas, they take on a similar role to a deity. They are supernatural beings that exist in a heaven that have supernatural powers that you can pray to to help you in life. Okay, so they're basically substitutes for gods, and they take on a very similar function and role in people's lives. So Buddhists don't pray directly to gods and deities as such, but to their bodhisattvas. Right. And there's going to be, there's all kinds of bodhisattvas. I'm just going to highlight a couple of important ones, right? And Avalokiteshvara is a, a very important one, who is seen as sort of like the right hand man, the right hand assistant to Amitabha Buddha. And because Amitabha Buddha isn't there to help you with things in this life. His role, okay, Amitabha Buddha is have faith in him, he'll, he'll be brought into his heaven. And then from there, you know, you're brought to nirvana. So he's a type of deity that brings you to salvation spiritual salvation sets you free from future rebirth okay 
very similar to what we saw in Hinduism, like with Vishnu and Shiva and Mahadev, the great goddess. Uh, those three deities are the ones that bring salvation to you. But other deities, like Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, and Ganesh, the room, remover of obstacles, they help you with stuff in this world, okay? And uh, so they're the ones that you would pray to, like, oh, please help me be successful in my business, you know, or whatever it is. Likewise here with the bodhisattvas, they're going to be beings that help you with stuff in this world. So there'll be those that can help for healing and, and, and bring health to you, right? Uh, uh, and, and to protect you from harm and danger, like Avalokiteshvara would. You know, if you're going on a trip and you want to be protected from danger, you would pray to Avalokiteshvara, okay, and ask for help, right? Uh, so this is what happens here. Okay, just in terms of the big picture of how <laughs> you can't get rid of the gods, okay? It's, no matter how hard you may try, even like for Siddhartha, all right? Uh, you just don't get rid of the gods. They'll just, they show up always in one form or another. And that's a very interesting thing. Okay. Anyway, so this is Avalokiteshvara. Now, the thing is, is Avalokiteshvara will appear in the history of Buddhism in various forms. Okay. In India, is always predominantly male. Likewise, in Tibet, okay, and in Tibet and in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there's going to be a belief that develops that the Dalai Lama, the leader of a particular sect within Tibetan Buddhism, and there's four main Tibetan Buddhist schools or sects, and the Dalai Lama is the head of the Galukpa school, and in the history of Tibet, at a certain point, when that uh, uh, head, the Dalai Lama, became the king of Tibet, uh, the belief got developed that the Dalai Lama is uniquely an incarnation of this Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara. Okay. And ever since then, that's been the belief that the Dalai Lama is an actual physical incarnation of this Bodhisattva. Okay. And, you know, and that obviously served to empower uh, that kingship to remain permanent because who would dare to overthrow such a person, right? But this is what happens in the history of Tibet. And, uh, and so, of course, you've got the whole Tibetan tradition of trying, you know, when the uh, uh, Dalai Lama dies, uh, that the, the Tibetan monks will go on search for a new baby born uh, at around that time. That would be then the incarnation of the Avalokiteshvara, who will then become the next Dalai Lama and ruler of Tibet, okay, historically. Okay, okay so that's a, a unique little thing here in Tibet about Avalokiteshvara. Now, what happens in China? is when uh, Mahayana Buddhism goes into China and the teachings of Avalokiteshvara is this being of compassion, reaching out a hand of help to all living beings, right? Uh, it's such like a compassionate, loving image that you can pray to for help whenever you need it. Well, what happens in China is the Avalokiteshvara kind of concept merges with a more indigenous idea of a, a goddess of compassion. And that kind of emerging and blending of the two created a feminine image uh, version of Avalokiteshvara. That in China, you'll find this image of Kuan Yin. And you can see, you know, Kuan Yin is written in two different ways, uh, as you can see there. And there to the right bottom, you'll see the image of Kuan Yin. And that is sort of the feminine embodiment of Avalokiteshvara. And so if you go to a Buddhist temple, and, and normally when this was live, I would take my class to a Buddhist temple in Richmond, you know, I'd take them to a Krishna temple, you know, do some field trips. And, um, and so there you would see both. You would see exactly a gold statue like this of Avalokiteshvara with a thousand hands, as well as the images uh, like you see here on the right of Kuan Yin. That looks very similar to me. I always think of the Virgin Mary for some reason. Uh, and she's often in blue as well and uh, in robes like that. And, you know, yeah, you'll have that kind of an image that's very common. And so this is what happens in China. And, the, and then also in Japan, a similar thing. You'll have this feminine version also going into Japan. There she's known as Kanyan. Okay, <laughs> that's the Japanese version, excuse me. <coughs> and you'll also <coughs> find, you know, the, uh, this kind of imagery as well. You'll find both the masculine and feminine imagery in China and Japan. Okay, but as a, a being that embodies compassion, who hears your prayers, will answer your prayers, and basically takes on the role and function of a type of deity. Okay. Okay. Then you have Maitreya, the Buddha of the future. 
okay? The Buddha of the future. Well, if he's the Buddha of the future, he also has, in a sense, taken on the Bodhisattva path. Uh, he is one of these beings who's going to, is on the path destined for enlightenment, right? And he's waiting up there in heaven, waiting for the right time to come to earth. And so uh, what you'll find in India and Tibet, you'll have the classic kind of Buddhist version, which is to your right here, okay, of Maitreya. But when this idea comes into China, an interesting thing happens there again. There, uh, Maitreya merges with, again, a very popular kind of, I'm not too sure the whole history of this being, but a Santa Claus type figure of this jolly, big bellied, roly poly, happy guy who would love to go from village to village with a bag full of presents on his back to give to children presents to give to children, and is always laughing and jolly with a big belly, right? And, uh, and so there was sort of uh, legends about such a figure of some kind, and that, excuse me, that merged with Maitreya, the Buddha of the future, so that this is a very typical Chinese portrayal, portrayal of Maitreya, uh, and there he's known as the laughing Buddha, okay? But that's a Chin Chinese thing, okay? It's a Chinese thing, not an Indian thing. All right, so just so you know. And he's the Buddha of the future, okay? Yeah. Oh, and then you have, excuse me, uh, images here of um, a couple of other bodhisattvas, the medicine Buddha and Manjushri, the, the, the bodhisattva of wisdom, okay? So the, the bodhisattva of wisdom will help you in your meditation to become wise, to understand the teachings of the Buddha. The medicine Buddha will help bring health and healing to you. So here again is where various bodhisattvas and enlightened beings show up to meet the needs of the people in various ways, and they function very similarly to God's, all right? Okay, so I'm wondering how we're doing. I guess we're doing okay time-wise. I hope you guys are doing all right, okay. I don't want to really break this up. I want to finish this part. So um, another thing that gets introduced here in Mahayana Buddhism is the Trikaya doctrine of the Buddha. And I had mentioned that the Buddha gets deified. And so what happens here is with Mahayana Buddhism, all right, the idea is that everybody's going to get enlightened. Everybody's going to get to Nirvana. There isn't just uh, the Buddha of the past, Siddhartha, the Buddha of the present, Maitreya, the Buddha of the future. Well, we have um, uh, Amitabha, the Buddha. Okay, he's a Buddha. And they hold that there are many Buddhas out there. In fact, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, they hold there's, there's no limit to the number of Buddhas. In fact, each one of us, every living being, is a potential, is, has potential for Buddhahoodness. <laughs> we all have an inner Buddha that needs to be awakened in some way. It is something latent present within us because if it wasn't latently present within us it would be impossible for us to become enlightened so the idea is that the possibility of enlightenment has to already pre-exist in some essential way within us all and it just somehow gets awakened in us because it you know for in order for it to exist it has to pre-exist uh at some way it has to be there, dormant, lying within all of us. Otherwise, it wouldn't even come into being in any kind of way. Nobody could become a Buddha, become enlightened. So it's held that it's got to be something universally present everywhere within all living beings, uh, this potential for Buddhahood. <laughs> and, and so that is one big issue. And, and so that, that they felt we cannot limit Buddhahood to just three. One of the past, one of the present, one of the future, ta-da. It's like, no, 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 no. It's got to be infinite, right? And universally accessible, universally possible. So that's one key thing. Second issue that arose for them is like, you know, Siddhartha's journey. Remember the, the four passing sites in the very beginning. What led to Siddhartha taking up the journey, the spiritual quest for enlightenment, is that he encountered somebody who grew old, got sick, and then died, right? And, and that this is, this is so typical of this realm of samsara. We grow old, get sick, and die to be reborn, and grow old, get sick, and die, and we're just stuck in this trap, this cycle of growing old, getting sick, dying, being reborn, grow old, get sick, and die. Oh, here is Siddhartha who apparently has become this enlightened being that hasn't been around for a couple of million years, you know, in terms of the Buddha of the past. 
and so discovered the truth of the universe and was now actually supposedly greater than the gods and the gods in the heavens are like oh come on Buddha, we need you we need you to get enlightened so you can bring liberation even to us gods and here the buddha is supposedly greater than the gods and what happens to him he got old got sick with food poisoning and died just like the rest of us and yet he supposedly and this enlightened being who's greater than the gods and he still met the same fate as every one of us you know human beings it kind of poses a bit of a philosophical problem here <laughs> okay and uh, it doesn't fit too well here these ideas so so they uh, tweaked it all by saying well really he didn't really die really he wasn't really a human being like you and I, literally born to grow old, get sick and die. No, no, no. That all was a bit of a mirage. It was an appearance. It was a bit of an illusion. He just took on the appearance of being a human being and growing old like us and then getting sick and dying, kind of just, you know, putting on the show for that because it was his time to go. But he just put on this appearance, this apparition, uh, uh, took on this illusory form in order to bring us the truth of Buddhism at this level. Okay, but he really wasn't at all a human being like us. Okay? Hopefully, you get this. Um, it's a very similar concept that developed in the West in terms of why well, I could go on always, always on everything for hours. Uh, Docetism. Okay, in terms of early Christianity, was a debate about Jesus being human and divine and yada yada, and so a very similar concept was at play uh, there as it is here. It gets rejected uh, in Christianity, but here it gets endorsed. And, and that is that indeed, Siddhartha was not a human being like us. He was an apparition. You know, like when you see a ghost as an apparition, a ghostly appearance. It's a bit of an illusion, but not truly material and physical in the normal sense of the word, okay? In an equivalent way to all of us physical material beings. Uh, it was just an appearance on earth. And so, Anyway, so this is this is what becomes what. So this is how they solve it. They they, they just decide and develop the idea that there are three levels of Buddhahood, okay. And by three levels of Buddhahood, trikaya tri means three, kaya means body. This is also known as the triple body doctrine of Buddhahood, okay. The triple body doctrine of Buddhahood, trikaya. So that the first and the highest level of Buddhahood called dharmakaya or also the truth body okay uh dharma you know has many levels of meaning as you've probably already gotten but dharma means the eternal truth the eternal law it is that which is ultimate and absolute and so at the highest level of truth and the highest level of reality there's dharmakaya and this level of buddhahood is where buddhahood exists as this pure unity as it's an eternal, formless essence of Buddhahood. There's no differentiations, no distinctions, no this nor that, no names and forms and bodies of any kind. It's just like an ocean of Buddhahood. This is the true highest level of Buddhahood as source, as essence of all Buddhahood. Okay. Well, from that ocean and essence of universal Buddhahood, it manifests into heavenly bodies. And a heavenly body, technic, more technically, is a sambhogakaya. Samboga means pleasure body. And these are the heavenly Buddhas. So from this formless unity ocean of pure essence of Buddhahood, there then appears the form of heavenly Buddhas with specific names, a specific form, living in a heaven. Okay, uh, as you can see here, and therefore is present in the wheel of existence of samsara in the heavenly realm. And this heavenly Buddha is now accessible to bring us, help us here in this life, help us get us to nirvana by bringing us into their heaven and then from that heaven into nirvana, eliminating and wiping out. Oh, I don't think I mentioned that, wiping out our past karma because, like, Amitabha Buddha has like this bank account of so much good karma, like, he's a multi billionaire, trillionaire of good karma. 
and you got some bad karma, I, I can just delete it. You know, your karmic debt, I can wipe out. I pay it off with all my good karma from my bank account, okay? So that you don't have to be reborn to deal with your bad karma. You're set free from all karma. You could just get to come here to my heaven. And then from there, I bring you into nirvana. And sort of how it works. So you have then these heavenly Buddhas, right? And Bodhisattvas existing. Uh, and that is a certain level of Buddhahood. Uh, the second highest level of Buddha going from coming from pure essence into heavenly forms in the heavens to help us, right? Then from these heavenly forms, Buddhahood can then appear on earth into a physical body, into an earthly Buddha. And that's where rupa kaya means a physical body, nirmana kaya, apparitional body. It's just two terms for the same idea of appearing as an earthly Buddha. And there was a, an earthly Buddha in the past. Siddhartha is our earthly Buddha at the present. And Maitreya, who right now is in a heavenly Buddha, is going to come to earth and be the future earthly Buddha. Is going to come in that apparitional form in order to bring us the truth of Buddhism. Okay? You guys get this? I hope. Uh, so those are the three levels of Buddhahood. And this is how, how they understand that Siddhartha, he really wasn't truly a physical human being like us. He was an apparition, a ghostly appearance that by design was brought to earth in order to communicate and speak to us and teach us the truths of Buddhism to help lead the way, to bring us the truths of all this stuff so that you know, we can eventually attain liberation. All right. Now, do you see any similarities between this and what we saw in Hinduism when we talked about Vedanta philosophy and how you had the idea of Brahman, Nirguna, without qualities, without qualifications, uh, Brahman, Nirguna, without any names, forms, uh, qualities, descriptors, um, pure unity, pure source, the essence of all that is. And then manifesting into this world of Sanguna with qualities. And there then you have uh, the Supreme Being in the name and form of Vishnu or Shiva, right? Of the various gods. And then you'll have these gods, specifically Vishnu, who will come to earth as an avatar. Take on a physical form in order to complete a mission. So Vishnu becoming an avatar like a fish that pulls the boat of Manu onto a shore, onto a mountaintop to save him from the flood. Or in the form of a dwarf, you know, to save the universe from this evil demon. Uh, in the form of Krishna, <laughs> okay, to speak to Prince Arjuna, you know, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, right? Uh, so you'll, and those are avatars. Those are then incarnations of Vishnu in particular forms for a certain purpose. But they were apparitions. Okay, they were apparitions. Um, they just served a temporary purpose to complete a mission. It's a very similar idea at play here. Okay, very similar kind of three tripart level of reality and, and how it gets packaged together. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. So I'm going to end this one here because it's quite a bit here uh, to deal with, and then I'll continue on in the next uh, recording. Ciao.